my pleasure to welcome in another good friend, guy I've known almost as long as I've known Larry Kruger. It's John Dickinson who checks in from the Giants game to talk about the Warriors. This man is everywhere. What's going on, J.D.? What's going on, fellas? Yeah, good to be with you uh, as always. What did you make of the Mike Dunleavy Jr. introductory press conference today? Was it uh, pretty much according to plan? Yeah, two things that stood out to me. One, one I liked. The other one I'm not so sure I agreed with. I'll give you the thing I liked at first. I, I, I was impressed with with Dunleavy's calm. Like he, he, you know, and that's his demeanor in general. Obviously, if anything, it was maybe part of the problem uh, why you know it didn't work out for him as a player with the Warriors, given the fact that he was the number three pick and it, he was just kind of. You know, calm and you know, like he lacked fire as as you know he wasn't playing well, and and the fans were expecting so much more going back now a couple of decades. But uh, I I was impressed with his you know ability to seem like he knows what he's in for in terms of you know leading this organization alongside Joe Lacob and and Kirk Lacob and and all of the different voices in the room. So I, I think that calm as Joe was up there trying to you know make sure everybody knew that 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 it's a collaborative uh, you know type situation between everybody in the front office and not just him or him and Kirk making all the decisions uh I I thought you know that that level head is something that's gonna you know be needed for the Warriors as he tries to to help guide them you know back to being a championship level contender after winning 44 games and getting bumped by the Lakers in, in the second round now the other thing and this could I'll give you the other angle of this, and this could have been posturing, but for me, there was a little too much of a tone from Mike Dunleavy that the Warriors are a couple of minor tweaks away. Like, oh, just you know, minor tweak here or there, and everything's going to be good. And you know, he talked up Jordan Poole pretty strongly. Uh, he, I thought, gave a, a pretty diplomatic answer with respect to Jonathan Kaminga, as expected. But the fact remains to me. This team can't just run it back plus a couple veteran minimum players and their 19th pick and expect to go from where they finished last season to being a championship contender again unless there's going to be some major leaps and bounds made by the, the young players. And that's something that I just can't I, I can't buy into that happening. They're going to have to prove to me as an organization that, that, that that's going to happen. So, again, a lot of it could be trying to put a positive face forward, upsell, maybe some of the players that you're trying to move. But I didn't totally disagree with, in essence, the calm that he seemed to have over, yeah, you know, a couple tweaks and, and you know, internal development and, and things are going to be fine. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, nobody's even mentioning that, you know, they, this team had so few players in the prime of their career. One of them was Dante DiVincenzo, and DiVincenzo's almost sure, surely going to gonna bolt. So... Uh, for for yeah, graced out, yeah. I mean, he's going to make a lot more, and so he's going somewhere else. What do you think? I mean, how does this team wind up with their older players are getting further away from their prime? Their young players are so young that I don't know that they're even going to creep into their prime years uh, beginning this year. So, do you start to look at flipping these younger players like Kuminga and Moody and Baldwin and Rollins? for some slightly older guys that may be entering their prime? I mean, what's the game plan, do you think? Yeah, I think that is the game plan. I think the game plan is looking to move the, the 20, 21, 22-year-olds for 26, 27, 28-year-olds, if you can. Like, think more of that Andrew Wiggins point, you know, age range, right, where, where it's, it's younger than the big three, but older than... The, the lottery picks that they've had over the last couple of years and, and Kaminga and Moody. And, I, and I'm not saying all of them go, but I think the Warriors are probably listening on everybody at, at this point. And, and, you know, I've said it. I think, you know, Steph, Clay, Draymond, Steve Kerr, they all, I think, double, triple, quadruple, quintuple down on the fact that they want to, to continue to move forward and, and you know, compete together. I think Andrew Wiggins and Kevon Looney are an extension of that, and those are two players that are in that mid-range, right, where they're veterans, but they're young enough uh, to where you know they're not in their 30s. And so you, you need, I think, two more players that are going to be in your top seven or eight that are going to be 
in that age range and productivity range. And so that may mean you have to sell a little bit on the young to get into you know, that. That's a range you can win with. I mean, I, 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 you, know, you can you can you can have those guys and you know around for a couple of years. So to me, it's finding the right deal on more proven NBA talent that's still relatively young, especially by comparison to the big three, and try to use that as your means to improve the roster. It, it doesn't mean trade everybody, but it means, I think, listen in on everybody among those young players. I think that means listen in, Dibs, on the 19th pick in the draft coming up here in, in three days and decide if that can net you a player that you think can be plugged right into your rotation, whether it's making the pick or whether it's using the pick to get that player that, that winds up on the roster in that specific role. John Dickinson here on 95-7 The Game, kind enough to take a few moments out as he's at the Giants game, coming off of the Mike Dunleavy Jr. press conference. I heard the question you asked, J.D., which was a good one. The one question I didn't hear asked was about the luxury tax and whether or not Joe Lacob is going to be willing to spend $450 million on next year's team or not, which leads me to the Draymond Green question. How do you think they navigate Draymond Green, knowing that he is going to opt out of his player option for the upcoming year, yet he wants a deal probably three years to match up with Steph Curry? What do you think the Warriors end up doing with Draymond Green? Yeah, I, I think he winds up coming back. I think a three-year deal is price of admission as far as the conversation goes. I think the plan was always for him to opt out and to get three years at you know maybe maybe a little bit less, but right around the the average value of that that twenty seven point five that he was going to get, uh, and I think it also gives him some flexibility to see if there is that one team out there that that really wants to add him at a at a significant enough number to make the Warriors uncomfortable. In essence, Draymond can can search out and and try to try to find some other options that that maybe scare the warriors into paying a little bit more than than they're comfortable with. And so, you know, what does it wind up being? Is it is it 3 and and 70 to 75 million? It's so funny. I, I think there's there's a lot of people and cuz I I think 3 and 70 75 is about right for Draymond that like that's about right in the middle. Like he might want 80 plus. Hell, he might want 90. But I know there's a lot of Warrior fans out there that think, well, he should be making it should be three and sixty or something like that. So I feel like the middle ground is in that seventy to seventy five range over the three years. But it's on Draymond now to go try and you know, not necessarily scare up an offer of that level because there aren't going to be a lot of teams that would be able to to willingly offer that. But but put the pressure on the Warriors in a sense that maybe he would go and take less elsewhere. I don't think that's his end game in this. I do think he wants to be a warrior for the next three years. I think that's that's his intent. I think they want him to, to be here. So I, I do think it winds up getting worked out. But then the other part of it is, and this is where it does relate to the, the luxury tax and the different aprons and, and all of that and the penalties to be paid, is the difference between $70 million, let's say, over three years and $80 million over three years is exponential in terms of the right. actual cash, depending upon the way the rest of the roster looks. So it's not nothing, but on the surface, you know, the impression I get is that Joe Lacob is going to be willing to, to pay that for one more go at it. And, it. and it seems to be, at this point, more of a year-to-year -year proposition. Like the, it, the, the sounds are that they really want to run it back and almost do whatever they can to run it back, maybe not with the exact same team, but with the exact same level of spending, and then you see where you're at a year from now, and if you don't love the position you're in, then maybe you start to look to, to make some some more significant savings as far as who's who's not around. You know, we saw Beal dealt from the Wizards, and if you're a Wizards fan, you, you didn't like what you got back, but it's kind of a financial reset. Do you think that kind of thing could be looming for Jordan Poole? I mean, something's got to give here. Either Joe's going to be paying a lot of money, and they're going to move off of one of these big time players and contracts, or um, you know, you know. I mean, I I don't see how everybody gets what they want. I don't see them running it back and and, and trying to do it cheaply. To me, it seems like moving pool might be for either expirings or guys that you know are expiring in a year might be the only way for Joe to kind of hit the financial reset. How do you see it? Yeah, I I think they're willing to to 
reallocate the the twenty seven million or, or whatever it is for Jordan Poole you know, that he's going to be paid this year. I think they're willing to reallocate that you know moving forward, uh, and, and whether that's for another year, I don't think it necessarily means you're only taking players back that that have one year or two years left on on the contract. I think you you could, although they don't want to get in the Bradley Beal type scenarios where I mean that is just it makes sense for Phoenix but that is a god awful contract that that has the potential to not not look good at, at the end of this thing for Phoenix but what do they care if they wind up winning an NBA championship in in, in the meantime but I, I think you could take a player back that has multiple years you know two three years left on his deal and then if things don't work out it doesn't necessarily have to be that player that that gets trimmed. I think you could you know move forward. I mean, Clay Thompson projects to be a free agent at, at the end of this year. You know, depending upon the, whoever you go and acquire, you know, and how this next season looks, you know, maybe maybe a year from now the conversation is: Do the Warriors keep Clay Thompson at all? And that could be a way to to save some of that. Uh, you know, exponential taxing of of being over the cap and being over the the different aprons. So I think there's always some flexibility to move off or or tear down or become a little bit more financially prudent, let's say, uh, if you need to. I, but I don't think to, to answer your question later. I don't think that hamstrings the Warriors from going out and getting a player or committing to a player in a trade that's you know there would be a similar financial commitment to to what they already had projected let's say for Jordan Poole over the next few years you're listening to 95 7 the game KGMZ FM and HD1 San Francisco always live on Twitch YouTube and the free Odyssey app John Dickinson joining Kruger and Dibs Kruger in for Willard here on 95 7 the game one Giants one JD before we let you go Giants have won seven in a row, but they've got injuries all over the roster. Is this Giants team for real, or is this just a flash and a blip in the radar for a team that likely will find its level again and be back toward 500? Yeah, I, no, I, I think it's real in the sense that they're a contender for a playoff spot. I, I don't know that it's real and that they're going to run off 20-10 and 10 from now until the, the rest of the year and, and, and end up... You know, although I do think the National League West is wide open when you look at Arizona leading it, and the Dodgers are extremely banged up themselves, and we saw what the Giants were able to do to them over the weekend, and 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 really, you know, handle them in in so many different ways, dominant, dramatic. Uh, so I think that was a little bit of a statement. I, I don't view the Giants though as a as a you know championship contender at this point, if that makes sense. But but there's six teams in each league that that make the postseason and i definitely think the giants are, are contenders just when you look at the standings for for one of those spots and you know that in and of itself is something that i think we all would have considered laughable a month ago i mean they went from six under to seven over from mother's day to father's day which is you know pretty impressive so yeah could there be a little bit of a dip sure i don't think it's going to necessarily be the kind of dip where they end up back you know, around that that 500 mark, and and on the outside looking in, as far as you know, the middle of the pack teams that are outside of that top six. I think they're going to be in a battle for a top six spot for the for the duration uh, at this point. Any rumblings around the yard about Kyle Harrison coming up tomorrow? I know, I know, uh, you know, Harrison and Wisenhunt are these two big time lefties, and the Giants could really use some rotation you know, front of the rotation kinds of guys, and people are saying Marcus Stroman and Lucas Giolito and trading. But, man, it seems like it might be easier just to promote those guys that are in the system. Well, are you hearing anything? Some people have speculated that Harrison may go, may be promoted as soon as tomorrow. Yeah, I, I mean, at, at some point they're going to give him the – they're just going to give him the rain. I mean, I'm looking at – you know, that's the, the slot with, you know, Brebbia now down – and they're using an opener tonight in, in Walker, and and they've tried to to map out you know who's going to be you know making these starts. Uh, Wednesday is, is the one that they've got listed right now as TBA. They've got DeSclafani going tomorrow and Alex Wood on Thursday. So if he's going to come up, obviously you want him to come up and, and and be able to to make a start in in a significant way. Uh, so I mean we'll see. It, it seems like they're still trying to build him up. A, a little bit and trying to make absolutely sure that once he comes up, he's coming up for good. Uh, but but I'm kind of with you. I mean, the, the the Giants, Larry, have been able to you know bring a lot of these young players up, and they've they've all contributed. They haven't necessarily been carriers, 
you know, on certain nights they have been, but they've all been able to contribute while they've gotten a little healthier and they've won games. And so you can, you know, you're in a way you're doing the whole win and develop thing, which I think, you know, we've, we've seen can, can be so difficult to do so that they, in, in a way they've got the best of all worlds kind of out of nowhere when, when nobody expected it. I, I think Harrison would be just another step toward that line. I hope we do see it. I don't know that we're going to. The, the rumblings that I've heard haven't necessarily led to it, but I, I kind of hope we do get to see it because that, that would just add another infusion. Uh, you know, the, the likes of Schmidt and Bailey and Matos have, have already provided here over the course of the last month. John Dickinson, our man on the streets. Appreciate you joining us, J.D. Great takes on the Warriors and good insight on the Giants. Enjoy the game tonight, J.D. We'll talk to you soon. All right, you got it, fellas. Thanks for having me. My man, John Dickinson, joining Kruger and Dibs. Kruger in for Willard here on 95.7 The Game.